Well, all right then. Let's open our Bibles together to the book of Job, chapter 1. Job chapter 1 for our message from the Word of God this morning. As we conclude our series of messages honoring the men who took a stand 50 years ago when they established the Berean Bible Fellowship. We began yesterday's message by talking about the men who took a stand 242 years ago in 1776 when they declared our independence from England. As you may know, many of the men who signed that Declaration of Independence paid a steep price for the stand they took that July 4th. Five of the men who fought in the Revolutionary War were captured and served time as prisoners of war. Twelve of those men had their homes burned to the ground and one of them lost his son in the war. And when General George Washington was aiming his cannons at Yorktown and he wasn't sure which house British General Cornwallis was staying in, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence told him, aim at my house. It's the nicest house in town. And so it's the most likely place where the officers are staying. So General Washington fired on Nelson's house, killing a number of British officers, but badly damaging Nelson's house, as you can imagine. And the list of ways that those men paid for the stand they took goes on and on. And we are all the beneficiaries of that stand today. And we are also the beneficiaries of the stand that those men took 50 years ago when they established the BBF. All of whom also paid a price for the stand that they took. My first pastor, Pastor Jeff Farrell, was one of the men who founded Brian Bible Fellowship. And as I mentioned the other day, if you were here during the 50th anniversary celebration that we had, he lost over half of his congregation because of the stand he took for Paul's gospel. At Berean Bible Society, Pastor Stam suffered the loss of many of his lifelong friends and many of Berean Bible Society's financial supporters. So I would like to conclude this series of messages by talking about the price that you might have to pay if you decide to follow in the footsteps of the men who founded BBF by taking a stand of your own for Paul's gospel. Because if you've been with us for this study, you know the way we're honoring those men who founded BBF is by not talking about them. But by doing a Bible study of the men in Scripture who took a stand for God and His truth in their dispensations, most of whom also paid the price for the stand they took. Men like Job. Remember what God said to Satan about him in the opening words of our text in Job 1 and verse 8. In Job 1 8, the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, 
one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now, as you can see, Job decided to take a stand for God by choosing to fear God and eschew evil. And did you notice that God's evaluation of that man was that there is none like him in the earth? In other words, he was the godliest man on the planet. And we already talked about how talked about how any stand that you take for Paul's gospel, for God and his truth in this dispensation, must begin with a decision to be godly. But as you know, Job paid the price for the stand that he took. When God let Satan afflict him with the loss of his wealth and the loss of his health and the loss of his family. As you know, those were, those were losses that God could have prevented. Losses that God did prevent for many years for Job because he obeyed God and lived a godly life. But then, God decided to change the program and stop rewarding Job for obeying him. Now, if all that sounds familiar, <laughs> it's because those were losses that God used to prevent when the Jews were his people and when they were obeying him. But then God changed the program from law to grace. And he's not preventing those losses anymore. No matter how godly a life you live, those of you who have suffered the loss of health and wealth and loved ones can say amen to that. So. If you want to take a stand for the Lord by living godly like Job, you're just going to have to learn to suffer those things with the patience of Job. And those, those losses, those weren't the only things that Job had to suffer. He also had to suffer the quote-unquote comfort of his friends, <laughs> each of whom accused him of being a great sinner and suggesting that God was punishing him for his great sins. Now, if you know the book of Job, you know that they usually didn't come right out and say that. But that's what they always implied. Look at your first reference in Job 4 and verses 1 to 8. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered, Remember, I pray thee, Job, whoever perished being innocent, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness, Reap the same. <laughs> That's his way of saying, Job, if you're perishing, it means you've sinned. If you're experiencing wickedness, it's because you're reaping what you sowed. And his second friend said much the same thing in Job 8, verses 1 and 20. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite, Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man. He's saying, Job, if God has cast you away, that means you're far from perfect. And if you think those attacks on his character were bad, look what his third friend said in Job 11, 1 and 6. Then answered 
Zophar the Naamathite, God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. <laughs> He's telling Job, I quit whining, Job. You're, you're getting less punishment than you deserve. How's that for comfort from a friend? Now, I don't know if you thought about this or not, but what his friends were doing was making a dispensational error. They were judging Job on the basis of what God used to be doing. Because they were unaware that God had changed the program. And now he was no longer rewarding the godliness of Job with health and wealth and prosperity. And if that sounds familiar, it's because it is what is going on today in the dispensation of grace. When you suffer the loss of your health or your wealth or your loved ones, prosperity preachers make the same dispensational error when they imply it's because you sinned. Now most of the time they don't come out and say that, of course. But when they teach, if you're godly, you'll be prosperous, that means if you're not prosperous, you're not godly. Right? And they give the, the illusion that the reason that they are so prosperous is because they are so godly. But do you know what God calls that kind of thinking today? It's in your next reference in 1 Timothy 6.5. He calls it perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. God says it is perverse and it is corrupt for men to say they've gained wealth and prosperity because they're so godly. Yet that's what Prosperity preachers say. And I don't have to tell you how that makes believers reproach themselves and second guess their spirituality when they're not wealthy and when they're not healthy. Beloved, we have the truth that sets men free from all of the guilt that religion puts on men. And if you think it's worth taking a stand for, say amen. amen. If you think it's worth any price you have to pay to take a stand for that, give me another amen. amen. Thank you. Now, the next man in the Bible we want to consider who paid a price for taking a stand was named Isaiah. A man who one day heard God ask him a question in Isaiah 6, 8. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Now if you want to talk about taking a stand, that's it. But he learned he would have to pay a price for taking a stand. He learned that when the Lord went on to tell him in the next verse, Isaiah 6, 9. Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. God said to Isaiah, Go tell Israel what I want you to say, but they're not going to understand it and they're not going to perceive it. How would you like to be given a commission like that? <laughs> how, how enthusiastic would you be knowing that people weren't going to get what you had to say? If I were Isaiah, I'd want to know how long I'd have to serve a sentence like that. And you know what? So did he. Look at your next reference. In Isaiah 6.11, Then said I, 
Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the land be utterly desolate. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I mean, it'd be one thing if God said, they're not going to listen to you, but eventually they'll repent. That might make your stand a little easier to take. But to hear God say, keep preaching, though they're never going to believe it. You ever feel that way? That nobody wants to hear the grace message? That, that you just have to serve out a life sentence of telling people a message that they'll never believe? If you do feel that way, listen to what God went on to tell Isaiah in Isaiah 6, verses 11 to 13. He said, The land will be utterly desolate, but yet in it shall be a tenth, and it, the tenth, shall return to God. So what God was actually telling Isaiah in this passage was the majority of people are never going to listen. But there's always going to be a remnant who will. And beloved, while the majority of the people won't believe you, there will always be people who will. You just got to find them. And if you think it's worth any price you have to pay to find them, say amen. Amen. I do too. But the only way you're going to find him is if you take the same stand Isaiah did. When God asked, who shall I send? Who will go for us? Jump up and down like you're, we're in school and you say, oh, call on me. And say, here am I, Lord. Send me. But discouragement, discouragement was not the only price that Isaiah had to pay for the stand he took. You see, he lived in a day when, when God would ask his prophets to act out their prophecies. So, when the Assyrians were threatening that they were going to conquer Israel, and the Jews looked to Egypt to help Save them from the Assyrians instead of looking to God. Look what God told Isaiah to do about that. In Isaiah 20, verses 2 to 4. At the same time spake the Lord, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, <laughs> excuse me, and put off thy shoe. And he did so walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians, prisoners, naked and barefoot. That was God's way of telling Israel, if you want to trust Egypt to save you from the Assyrians instead of God so that they don't carry you away naked and barefoot, you need to know the Assyrians are going to conquer Egypt too and carry them away naked and barefoot. But how would you like to be the man who had to deliver that message to the people of Israel? Walk around naked for three years just so people will stop you on the street and, and ask you, well, why are you running around in your birthday suit? <laughs> just so you can explain the illustration that God was giving them. That if they kept looking to Egypt to save them from the Assyrians, that's how they'd end up too. Maybe you're thinking, ah, big deal. The only, pray, only price he had to pay 
for taking a stand was little embarrassment. Well, if that's what you're thinking, guess what? The only price you're likely to have to pay for taking a stand for Paul's gospel is a little embarrassment. A little embarrassment when people laugh at you for living godly lives. A little embarrassment when unbelievers scoff at the, at the gospel. A little embarrassment when, when believers ridicule Paul's gospel. And a little embarrassment when you get to the end of your life and you look back at your life and you remember that most people didn't want to listen to you. And you feel like a failure. A failure who wasted his life. If you don't think Isaiah felt like that, look what he said 46 years after he said, Here am I, send me, in your next reference. In Isaiah 49, 4, then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. After 46 years of telling people, hear ye, but having them not understand. After 46 years of telling them, see ye, but having them not perceive. Isaiah was depressed. Feeling like he spent his life for nothing. Did you ever feel that way? Maybe you've served the Lord 47 years like I have. But you feel like you've labored in vain. You've spent your strength for nothing. If you do, do you know how you need to encourage yourself? The same way Isaiah went on to do it in your next reference, in Isaiah 49, 4 and 5. Right after saying, I've labored in vain, spent my strength for nothing, he said, yet surely my judgment is with the Lord. And then he drew strength from that thought, and he said, and now saith the Lord that formed me, saith the Lord that formed me to bring Jacob again to him. Even though Jacob be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord. God sent me to gather Israel, and even though they're not gathered, I'll still be glorious in the eyes of the Lord. And if you're here today beating yourself up, thinking you're a failure because people haven't gathered around you to hear more of the truth that you've given your life, to share with them. Just do what Isaiah did and remember to leave your judgment with the Lord. And let him decide whether or not you're a failure. And then take him at his word. When he says, you might be a failure in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of God, you're glorious. And the thing about... Isaiah chapter 50 that'll really rot your socks is that it's speaking prophetically of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that because of what Isaiah went on to say in the very next verse. Verse 6. And he said, God said, it is a light thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Well, let me ask you a question. Was, was Isaiah going to be for salvation? Was Isaiah going to be the one? He's, no. The Lord Jesus is the one who will ultimately gather Israel. And be God's salvation to the ends of the earth. But when he didn't gather Israel in his first coming, do you think maybe he felt 
like he'd labored in vain and spent his strength for nothing. If you think he didn't, I would argue that Isaiah 49 says otherwise. Because that chapter's about him as much as it is about Isaiah. Beloved, Jesus Christ had feelings just like you did. Nobody likes to be rejected. But let me ask you, even, the Lord, even though the Lord did not gather Israel, will he still be glorious in the eyes of God? But well, he was then, and he will be again. And so was Isaiah when the Jews didn't listen to him, and so are you when people don't listen to you. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, this, that's all true for the Jews, but not for us. Because after all, didn't Paul say in our next reference in Galatians 4.10, you observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Well, well, wait a minute. Doesn't that show that Paul's labor would have been in vain if they continued to not listen to Paul and, and they continued to observe those holy days of the law? And how about what Paul told the Philippians in Philippians 2? Do all things without murmurings and disputings. That I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Doesn't that show that Paul's labor would have been in vain if they continued to murmur and dispute with each other? And let's not forget what Paul told the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempters tempted you and our labor be in vain. Doesn't that show Paul's labor would have been in vain if Satan succeeded in tempting their faith? So how come Isaiah's labor wasn't in vain under the law, but Paul was concerned that maybe his labor would be in vain? And while you're chewing on that, <laughs> how come Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you carnal Corinthians know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Well, well wait a minute. How is it possible that the Apostle Paul's labor might have been in vain? But the labor of the carnal Corinthians wasn't. Well, did you notice that Paul told the Corinthians that their labor wasn't in vain in the Lord? Beloved, all of our labor is in vain by worldly standards, but not in the Lord. That's how Paul could say in your next reference in 2 Corinthians 2, 14, Thanks be to God, who always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. In them that are saved, and in them that are perishing <sighs> to the one were the savor of death unto death and to the other the savor of life unto life my dear Christian friend my dear grace believer friend when you decide to take a stand for Paul's gospel you can't lose you come up smelling like a rose no matter how people respond in the eyes of God or in the nose of God I guess I should say you are glorious in the eyes of him and if that makes you want to take a stand for Paul's gospel say amen, amen. 
Now the last man we want to consider who paid the price for taking his stand is named Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, 4 and 5. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. First thing you learn about J Jeremiah here is that he wasn't sent just to the nation of Israel like most of the prophets. He was sent to minister unto the nations, all the nations of the Gentiles. So right off the bat, you have a lot in common with Jeremiah because you preach Paul's gospel. And I know you know what Paul says about his gospel in the next reference in Romans 16, 25. He said, my gospel is made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. It's our job to get Paul's message to all the nations. We share the same commission in Ephesians 3, 9 to make all men see, not just Jewish men, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Jeremiah was God's first prophet to the nations. We're the present day prophets to the nations. And now I don't know about you, but when I read about this commission that God was giving Jeremiah, whenever I think about men in the Bible getting a commission from God, I always picture them eager to carry it out, like Isaiah. Ooh, 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 ooh. Then I think back to how shy I was when I was first saved. But after a year of listening to my grace pastor teach the grace message and comparing what he said to what I was hearing on Christian radio, I knew we had the answer to all that religious confusion and I knew somebody had to preach our message. And I knew one thing for sure, I didn't want it to be me. <laughs> I was a child in my understanding of Paul's gospel. I didn't think I'd ever know the message well enough to be able to share it with other people. Is that where you're at this morning? If it is, it might encourage you to know that initially Jeremiah felt the same way. Look at Jeremiah 1 6. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I, I, I can't speak to the nations, for I am a child. And he was talking about a child in his understanding. When God called Jeremiah, he said, in effect, Who, me? <laughs> How would I know what to tell the nations? Now, if his reluctance here sounds familiar, it's because when God called Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt, look what happened in Exodus 4.1. Moses answered and said, But behold, they won't believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they'll say, Ah, the Lord didn't appear to you like you're saying he did. But if you know the story, God told Moses, just relax, I'll turn your rod into a serpent, and they'll follow you. <clears throat> now, you would think Moses would have been convinced by that, right? But he came up with another excuse for not taking a stand for God, didn't he? Exodus 4.10, Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I'm not eloquent, but I'm slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Moses said, God, I, you know I wasn't born with the gift of gab. So what did God tell him about that? Exodus 4.14, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses and he said, Aaron thy brother can speak well. He'll be your spokesman unto the people, the people of Israel. Do you know what all that teaches? All that teaches us, no matter what your objection is this morning to taking a stand for the Lord, He's got an answer for you. You're not going to get the drop on God. But now let's go back to Jeremiah and let's see how God answered Jeremiah's objection. 
as to why he couldn't obey God's call for him to take a stand. In Jeremiah 1 7, the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee shalt thou speak. God answers him and says, I'll tell you what to say, and they will follow you. But now here, you have to ask a question. How come he didn't answer Jeremiah the same way he answered Moses? How come he didn't say to Jeremiah like he said to Moses, I'll confirm your words with miraculous signs and they'll follow you? Well, don't forget, God was sending Moses to the Jews. And what do we read about the Jews in your next verse? Jerob, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Jews require a sign. So God gave Moses some signs to show to the Jews. But who did God send Jeremiah to? The nations of the Gentiles. Just like he sent Paul and you and me. And, and what do the Gentiles require according to your next verse? The Jews require a sign, but the Greeks... Seek after wisdom. That's why when Jeremiah said, I can't speak for you, God, God didn't enable him with, with miraculous signs to get him to follow him. Instead, he went on to tell Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, 9 and 10, The Lord said unto me, Behold, I've given you words, not miraculous signs. I have put my words in your mouth. Words of wisdom. See, I have this day set thee over the nations. Instead of miracles, God gave Jeremiah the word of God. Is there anything you can learn from that? As you carry out your commission to the nations, don't be looking to God for, for backup to confirm your words with miraculous signs like he did for Moses. He's given you his word. Because the Gentiles still seek after wisdom. And God has given us a very special wisdom, hasn't he? In your next verse. 1 Corinthians uh, 2, 7. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom. We have what the nations need. So don't be trying to go to war with Israel's weapons. <laughs> now that God has recalled those weapons. Instead, we need to do what God told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.17. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak to the nations all that I command thee. Don't be dismayed at their faces. That phrase, gird up thy loins, that's God's way of saying just suck it up and be a man and speak the word of God. And don't worry about the frowns they might, you might see on their faces. But God also gave them a promise, didn't he, in Jeremiah 1, 18 and 19. For behold... I have made thee this day a defensed city and an iron pillar. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. Now, if you're like me, you're, you read that and you say, well... I want to know how God made Jeremiah a defense city. I want to know how he made him an iron pillar so that God could make me that too. Well, did you notice he said in that verse, For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city. And you read that chapter and all God did that day was commission him and give him his word. That's how he made him an iron pillar in a defense city. 
And that's how he can make you one as well if you take a stand for Paul's gospel. Beloved, with the word of God rightly divided, you can be as invincible as Jeremiah. Because now you've got God's message for the Gentiles. Listen, I, I discuss our doctrine for a living every day. And I can tell you in 39 years of pastoring and 17 years of defending the truth of Paul's gospel on the front line there at Berean Bible Society, nobody can stand against what we believe and teach. We've got the message. We've got the truth. We've got the answer. So if you're preaching Paul's gospel, you're a defense city and an iron pillar. If you take a stand, you cannot lose. If you graciously present the truth, you will always win. Although your, oppon your opponents aren't always going to be willing to admit you've won, so you better get used to that right away. But you're winning, whether they admit it or not. But if you think Jeremiah didn't have to pay a price for the stand he took just because the Lord promised to deliver him, think again. Because look what God told him in Jeremiah 32, verses 6 and 7. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Buy thee my field, that is in Anathoth. Now I want you to think about that. I want you to think about what God was asking him to do. Because if you know your Bible, you know that for years, God has been telling Jeremiah to tell Israel that Nebuchadnezzar over there is about to come over here and clean your clock and conquer your nation. And then God tells Jeremiah, oh, by the way, I want you to buy some land in that nation. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, if you could go back in time, would, would you buy land in Poland in 1938? If God told you to? Knowing the Nazis were about to take the city over in 1939. And the land you bought would belong to them, not you. Well, Jeremiah knew the land he bought would soon belong to Nebuchadnezzar, but you know what he did? He bought the land anyway. But it encourages me that he's, he still wanted to know why. <laughs> he, he, look what he said to God in your next reference in Jeremiah 32. 24 and 25. The city is given to the hand of the Chaldeans, and here you've said to me, by thee the field. He's saying, okay, I did what you asked me to do. Do you mind telling me why you asked me to do it? <laughs> so God answers him in Jeremiah 32, 37 to 44. Behold, speaking of Israel, I will gather them and I will bring them again to this place for I will cause their captivity to return saith the Lord. God is saying, yeah, I know that telling you to buy land in Israel is like telling you to buy a ticket on the Titanic. But someday, I'm going to bring my people back to the land. So buying land in Israel might seem like a high price to pay to take a stand for me, Jeremiah. But it's actually an investment. An investment that you'll, you'll endure and enjoy and your children will enjoy, endure, <laughs> will enjoy for years to come. It's a good thing we're almost done. And you know what? So is the stand that you take for God. The money you give to the Lord's work is not wasted. It's invested. The time you give serving the Lord in your local church is not wasted. It's invested. 
The life that you give to the Lord is not a wasted life. It's an invested life. Everything you give to God is an investment. And every financial advisor will tell you that when it comes to investments, you got to be in it for the long haul, right? You can't get, get discouraged and sell your investments when the market crashes because it always bounces back. And if you sold low, you take an unbelievable financial hit. I know because that's what my dad did. In 2008 when the market crashed, my father sold all of his investments. I can remember him saying, this country's in deep trouble, this country's cr crumbling, and I want my money in the bank. Well, after he sold all his investments, within a couple of years, all of his investments had regained all of their value, and then some. But he'd lost out. And because of that, what he left to my brother and sister and I in 2011 when he died was, was a fraction of what he had a few years earlier. Now, I'm not bitter about that. Those of you who know me well know how little I care about money. I share that with you in case you're bitter about your life. And how you've invested it in serving God. If you're bitter about it, you just have to remember that you're not just in it for the long haul. You're in it for the eternal haul. <laughs> Investing your life, taking a stand for Paul's gospel, has its ups and downs just like the stock market, folks but it has dividends that it'll pay in eternity that are out of this world. So remember what Paul told the Corinthians in your last reference in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Beloved, Everyone has to stand for something. Why not stand for something that'll keep you from falling for all the errors of religion and keep other people from falling for them? A stand that God is counting on you this morning to take. And if you share the memories that I have that we saw on that screen yesterday, of the men who stood in this pulpit at this conference for the past 50 years. The way to honor them is by taking the same stand they took in 1968 for the truth of Paul's gospel. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for enough voice and breath to share your word with your people this morning. And I pray that it will have an impact in their lives, and that the truth of Paul's gospel will continue and not just survive, it'll thrive to the praise of your glory. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.